Regular viewers of my channel will know that I generally tend to focus my efforts on my favourite cartoon, Batman the Animated Series. This was the show that kickstarted the DC Animated Universe, a series of cartoons, comic books and movies that had an interconnected continuity. I recently made a community post asking if you, my viewers, wanted me to talk about the DCAU villains from outside of Gotham and, perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer was an affirmative yes. So to kick things off, let's look at the winner of my first community poll, Superman the Animated Series' villain, Toy Man. As is tradition, let's start by looking at the comic books and see how they influence this version of Toy Man. At the time of Superman the Animated Series airing, there had been two Toy Men? Toy Men. Two Toy Men. That sounds really weird. The first, Winslow P. Schott, was a gifted toy maker that decided to use his gifts for villainy, robbing banks, stealing money and generally being a pest. The Toy Man was more of a nuisance than a criminal genius with bad intentions, and he featured in a number of child-friendly stories, particularly in the 1940s. Shot would eventually retire from crime and devote himself to bringing joy to the world through his toys. The second Toy Man, Jack Nimble, wore a costume that more resembled a jester-style puppet, and he would take over the mantle of Toy Man. This Toy Man would be seen in the popular Super Friends cartoon, where he used child-friendly toys to befuddle the Justice League. In the comic books, he would be unceremoniously killed by the original Toy Man, who wanted to reclaim his title and defeat Superman after he mistakenly believed that Superman had destroyed his toy shop. Following Crisis on Infinite Earths, in which most of DC's continuity was reset, Winslow Shot was reimagined as a British toy maker whose toys were deemed to be too old-fashioned, and as such he was let go from his company. In his anger, Shot would turn his toys into deadly weapons and point them at his former employers. Shot would make his way to Metropolis in order to take out big baddie Lex Luthor, but would be foiled by Superman. In 1993, the Toy Man would be reimagined as a dark, gritty child killer with a shaved head, dark clothing, and voices in his head compelling him to kidnap naughty children. He would famously murder Cat Grant's son, Adam, telling her that he was glad that he'd killed her son because she was such a terrible mother. Years later, long after Superman the Animated Series went off the air, it would be revealed that the child-killing Toy Man was a highly realistic automaton designed to take Shot's place in prison that had experienced a pretty major glitch and that the mother it heard in its head was in fact Shot trying to get it to come home. Shot's backstory would be further expanded. Apparently, he had originally been reluctant to sell his designs until his beloved wife suddenly died in a car accident. In his grief, he sold the company, but grew to regret it when he learned how his toys had been weaponized. This was debunked, however, when it was revealed that his wife was another realistic automaton. So that brings us to the DCAU version of Toy Man. One of the great strengths of Batman the Animated Series is that the writers of the show had carte blanche to rework Batman's cast of villains. Their MO was to take everything that worked best in the comics and drop all of the accumulated, overcomplicated material that had built up over the decades. But with Toy Man, honestly, there really wasn't very much to work with, and there was absolutely no way that TV censors would let them use the child-killing version of the character. But that's not to say they couldn't take him down a disturbing path. It's interesting to note that they had already used a character that was very similar to the original Toy Man in Batman the Animated Series, the Mad Bomber, as seen in the BTS episode Beware the Grey Ghost. The Mad Bomber would recreate crimes from the Grey Ghost TV show using toys from the show to carry explosives. His entire motivation was to accumulate more money to collect more toys. So he wasn't exactly an inventor, he was just mad about toys. When it came time to develop Superman the Animated Series, the writers had something of a challenge ahead of them. Now, you may think I'm biased seeing as my whole channel is about Batman the Animated Series and mostly his villains, but Superman's rogues gallery is a bit limp in comparison. I think that part of the reason why Superman's classic villains could generally be a bit simplistic is Superman was at the height of his popularity during a simpler time in comics. Superman didn't exactly have the same dark renaissance that Batman did in the 70s, following the massive success of the Adam West starring TV show. And part of that is that Superman has always been portrayed as a bright positive symbol of hope, from his earliest days of beating up slum landlords all the way through to the modern era as a father to a growing family of superpowered beings. As such, a lot of his villains would focus on a specific gimmick that would offer Superman a suitable challenge. After all, if the Man of Steel can travel faster than a speeding bullet and is more powerful than a locomotive, then he would need similarly powerful foes. Now, that's not to say that there were never any interesting villains, far from it. John Byrne's reimagining of Lex Luthor as a business tycoon rather than a mad scientist is one particular standout. But more often than not, the villains were a bit gimmicky without much depth. 
all of that was a really long-winded way of saying there wasn't much that the Superman the Animated Series writers kept from the comics, and Toy Man is a great example of this. Their Toy Man is a disturbing, obsessive stalker type wearing a creepy porcelain mask, with his face stuck in a grotesque smirk. We never see Toy Man without his mask, so for all intents and purposes, that is his face. That mask is how he chooses to present himself to the world. Even in the Superman the Animated Series tie-in comics when Toy Man is in jail, he still wears that mask. It's creepy. The design of the character was inspired by a Danny O'Day ventriloquist dummy named George owned by writer Ryder Wyndham. Ryder would take his dummy with him on his travels around the world taking pictures of their adventures and putting them into a big book. He would then show that book to anyone that expressed the slightest interest. This book of photos was shared with Bruce Timm at a convention and it had a strong impact on him. Bruce would go on to redesign the Toy Man, inspired by George. And just for a little bit of fun, here's a photograph that Ryder posted in 2013 of a Toy Man action figure posing with George. And here is a picture of then Superman editor at DC Comics, Mike Carlin, scolding George. So with the design stage out of the way, the writers then had to come up with a suitably dark origin. The DCAU toy man is named Winslow Schott Jr. His father, Winslow Schott Sr., was a poor toy maker that signed a deal with Bruno Mannheim, the head of Intergang, to fund his toy making factory. Mannheim was more than happy to provide Schott with the factory, but it was also used as a front for Intergang's criminal activity. The police raided the factory, sent Winslow Sr. to jail, where he would pass away, leaving his son orphaned, moving around from one foster home to another. Once he reached 18, Winslow would dedicate himself to reclaiming his lost childhood and to avenging himself and his father. In his mind, his entire childhood had been ripped away from him by the actions of Bruno Mannheim. The thought that his father might have been a willing accomplice never enters his mind. While the subject is never really broached in the show, I personally have doubts as to how innocent Winslow Sr. really was. We're told that a numbers racket was run out of the factory, which is essentially a kind of illegal lottery involving the mob, and I find it hard to believe that Winslow Sr. wouldn't be aware of what was going on. And I don't mean to suggest that he was running the racket, but... I could believe that he was aware and just turned a blind eye. Note that there are two accounts of what happened. One, Clark reads from a newspaper which is cold and factual, while at the same time Toy Man delivers a more fairy tale like recap. It's important to note that this story is based on Toy Man's own memories from when he was a child, a mentally disturbed child. He is a textbook unreliable narrator. But at the same time, Toy Man is a genius. But instead of making toys to bring joy to children, he corrupts these once joyful symbols of childhood and uses them to get revenge on Bruno Mannheim. And there's the rub. Toy Man is desperate to reclaim his lost childhood, but he takes symbols of childhood, namely the toys, and warps them to suit his own devilish needs. When we first meet him, he interrupts the celebrations of Intergang after they successfully robbed a bank. He wants the thieves to send Mannheim a message by dropping a bouncing ball that increases the strength of its force with each successive bounce. Within a few moments, the ball makes short work of the thieves' armoured truck until Superman arrives to save them. Toy Man uses a fleet of remote control planes armed with machine guns to disrupt a ceremony that Mannheim is attending and sends a gigantic rubber duck to demolish his yacht. This creates a genuinely amusing scenario where Mannheim's henchmen are reluctant to open fire on a massive rubber ducky. Despite his genius, he still isn't really a match for Superman, and the episode ends with Toy Man's base exploding as Superman narrowly rescues Lois and Mannheim. All that's left is a broken Toy Man mask, which is a delightfully creepy image for the episode to end on. Toy Man doesn't appear all that often in the show, he has a blink and you'll miss it cameo in the Metallo-centric episode Action Figures, but his next big story comes from the Estas episode Obsession. In this episode, we meet a famous model named Darcy Mason, who appears to have a problem with an over-eager fan, the Toy Man. Toy Man seems utterly obsessed with Darcy and will do anything to get his hands on her. We would eventually learn that Darcy was one of Toy Man's creations, a gynoid. Why does that name make me feel uneasy? Essentially a model brought to life. In the DCAU, there once was a popular doll called a Darcy doll that the Toy Man based her likeness on. However, she gained sentience and wanted nothing to do with the creep Toy Man. As a synthetic human, Darcy possessed incredible strength and agility, and as such, most of the threats Toy Man sent her way were ineffective. Superman would agree to help Darcy, but she would reveal herself to be pretty malevolent. When her secret was revealed to Lana Lang, Darcy would explain that she intended to kill Toy Man to free herself from him, and when Lana tries to stop her, Darcy causes a fire, leaving Lana to perish. Or she would have if not for Superman. 
Toy Man was prepared for such an eventuality. He had included a failsafe that prevented her from directly harming him. However, she would soon learn that she was capable of indirectly harming him when she took control of their escape helicopter and caused it to plunge into the ocean. Now, I find the question of Darcy's humanity fascinating. Technically, she wasn't alive, but she clearly had her own desires, hopes, and dreams, and she would do whatever she could to achieve her goals, including some really awful things. And I think that Superman could relate to her a little bit. After all, he isn't human either, and they both hide their true selves from the world around them. Superman disguises himself as Clark Kent, the reporter, and Darcy as Darcy Mason, the model. But Darcy has no compassion or empathy. She doesn't care about killing Lana Lang. All she cares about is getting out from under Toy Man, so to speak. And there's something so utterly pathetic about Toy Man deciding to create himself a girlfriend based on a children's toy. It's like toys are so intrinsically part of his personality that every aspect of his life, from his own face to his partner, is fake. Winslow Shot clearly has identity issues that are deeply rooted in shame and despair, and it has twisted him up inside. Darcy would resurface years later in the Static Shock episode, Toys in the Hood. Darcy would pretend to be a teacher at Dakota Union High School, her aim being to find a child whose identity she could take over, and her target was Virgil's friend, Daisy. Darcy and Toy Man would conspire to learn everything they could about Daisy so that Darcy could replace her and live the actual life of a teenage girl, like some sort of demented Pinocchio and promised to love Toy Man forever. Toy Man had created a synthetic copy of Daisy, right down to her DNA, that was indistinguishable from the real thing, aside from her lack of an electromagnetic aura that apparently all human beings have. I don't know if that's really a thing. You have to wonder about the real-world application of this technology. Think of what he could do for people that have been in terrible accidents, or people with degenerative disorders, for instance. But no, all he cares about is fulfilling his own childish notions of love. And I don't think that Toy Man is looking to create a sexual partner for himself. I think he's just got this idea in his head that he needs some companionship, just so that he wouldn't feel so alone. Yet, rather than investing the time and energy that it takes to build genuine human relationships, he'd rather just build a sophisticated toy that was completely under his control. Unsurprisingly, Darcy would attempt to betray the Toy Man once again, but Toy Man was no fool. He'd built a failsafe that resulted in her synthetic body melting into a pool of goop, putting an end to Darcy. And I have to wonder, why did Toy Man give Darcy self-determination? I have to think that so that he could break her down and bring her under control. I think that part of him really enjoyed trying to bring her under his control, and when he couldn't succeed, he gladly extinguished her life. There's something really comical about this entire episode, not just the fact that this deranged grinning fool has such advanced technology, but it's the way Superman carries him around, like he's a naughty little boy or something, not a murderous kidnapper. And when the police turn up and take him away, he's still got that mask on. I find the image of him sat in the back of the police car, grinning away, weirdly amusing. Toy Man would briefly return in the Justice League episode Hereafter as part of the Superman Revenge Squad. Toy Man would invent a machine that could generate a ray that would seemingly completely disintegrate anything it touched, wiping it out of existence, and he would use this to kill Superman. In reality, he had actually discovered time travel, and his beam would send anything it touched thousands of years into the future. Again, another genius invention, completely squandered by his childish obsessions. Toy Man is undoubtedly a genius. He even assisted Lex Luthor in his attempts to restore Brainiac in Justice League Unlimited. But the thing that holds him back are his bizarre obsessions and the way he frames everything through the lens of childhood, or more specifically, his perception of what childhood should be. There's no telling what he could have achieved had he been able to move past his trauma. Instead, he's just a deranged weirdo. Okay. That's the end of my video essay. Thank you for watching it all. If you made it all the way through, um, I'll be back in the future with some more Superman villains. I've enabled the thanks button on this video, so if you really enjoyed it and have the means, feel free to send over a buck or two my way because every little helps. I'd also like to take the opportunity to plug memberships of this channel. Uh, for $1.99 a month, you get early access to video essays like this one. I'm uploading some exclusive videos, but don't worry, they're not video essays. Um, Non-members will always have access to my video essays regardless of anything. Uh, members also get priority responses, exclusive community posts, uh, call-outs, special icons that indicate you're a member of the channel, and custom emojis. So I'm going to be back next week to kick off the 25th anniversary of Batman Beyond celebrations by doing a whole month of Batman Beyond content, looking at the Batman of the future, Terry McGuinness. Hope to see you then.